He's the former Anglican Bishop of Durham in the UK and currently a senior research fellow at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford. He also happens to be one of the world's foremost authorities on the letters of St. Paul. He joins me tonight to talk about his brand new book, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter. Please welcome to the program, Professor N.T. Wright. Tom, thank you for being here. Um, as I mentioned, you thank are you. one of the world's leading biblical scholars, the foremost interpreter of St. Paul. Why and what makes Romans his greatest letter in your estimation? Well, R Romans is Paul's longest letter. That doesn't necessarily make it the greatest. But when you study mm -hmm. all the letters, Romans is the one above all, which seems to have been planned very, very carefully. Um, as a writer myself and as somebody who studied also uh, music and symphonies and so on, I have to say that Romans is structured extremely carefully into what you might call, musically speaking, four movements, uh, one to four, five mm. to eight, nine to 11, 12 to 16. And, and they each have their own coherence, but then they interrelate in the way that the movements of a symphony would interrelate. And I, I imagine that Paul had had this boiling up in his head for some years beforehand, and phrases in the letter um, um, marry up with phrases in the other letters, but he's here brought them together to make one single coherent argument to the, the churches in Rome, and he's worried about the churches in Rome because um, they, they are a bit suspicious of each other, the small house churches, and he wants them to get together together and learn to worship together and so on. And uh, mm. the, 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 the theological argument that he pulls together has sustained uh, theologians and church leaders from that time to this. I mean, famously, St. Augustine and Martin Luther and John Wesley and all sorts of people, and not to mention Karl Barth in the last century, have found that Romans has been the thing which have galvanized them into fresh thought and action and reorganization of how they preach and goodness knows what. So I think by common consent, Romans is the big one, and it's been the privilege of my life, really, mm. academically and personally, to be able to, to, to wallow around in it. Mm. Uh, Tom, tell me how St. Paul, in the letter to Romans, how he echoes the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms, which you reference in the book. Yeah. He, he, Paul was soaked in, in what we call the Old Testament, for him the Bible, of course, and he actually knows the Old Testament both in Hebrew and in the Greek version, I think particularly in the Greek version because that was the lingua franca of the day. Um, and he, he, like the other early Christians, he draws together several of the, of the Psalms again and again, and one in particular which always strikes me in Romans 8 now is Psalm 8, when he has this, uh, the, the psalmist has the vision of the human vocation. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you take thought for him? You've made him little lower than the angels to crown him with glory and honor, putting all things under his feet. And Paul has this vision of the original creation with humans being God's agents in bringing about his will in the world. And then when it all goes horribly wrong, God doesn't change that plan. He rescues humans so that through rescued humans, the world can be put right. And so he's woven that mm. into the way he, he sets out chapter 8. It's elsewhere as well. But the other thing in chapter 8, which is very striking, is that um, the Psalms, of course, have a lot of lament, asking God, why on earth is mm. this happening? What's gone wrong? And one of the lament Psalms is Psalm 44. And Paul echoes Psalm 44 twice in Romans 8, one time when he's talking about how now, when the world is groaning, as our world is groaning right now, then the people of God mm -hmm. are groaning within themselves, and God himself is groaning within, uh, within our hearts. And he says, God who searches the hearts knows what the Holy Spirit is thinking. That's a, a reference to Psalm 44. And then later in the chapter, he says, for your sake, we are being killed all day long and reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. That again is Psalm 44. So Paul is seeing both the grandeur of the human vocation and the suffering of the people of God as coming through from the Old Testament into the experience both of Jesus himself in his suffering and death and then his ascension and then of his faithful followers. This is just a little pinprick, but that gives you an idea of what's going on there. Yeah. We've seen in the Middle East, of course, the, the birthplace of Jesus torn apart by violence and suffering in recent days. What message from Romans deepens our biblical understanding of human suffering and the promise of ultimate glory with God. 
Oh, my. It, it, uh, I was afraid you were going to ask me this because, of course, we can't avoid the question because it has been so horrendous. Yeah. And uh, uh, mm. uh, just we in the UK are grieving over all sorts of things that are happening. And I know that you in the US are, are as well. Um, mm -hmm. But in the middle of it all, uh, Romans has this message that despite the mess that the world is in, the God who made the world, the God who made the covenant with Abraham, um, et cetera, et cetera, this God is righteous. He has done the right thing for the world in Jesus. He is doing the right thing for the world now. And the church has the vocation, not necessarily to be able to tell the rest of the world that it's getting it wrong, but to live as the faithful people of God and particularly the peacemaking mm -hmm. people of God. And, and that vocation mm -hmm. of the church to be the people who can hang on to the suffering and pain of the world and hold it in lament before God and then can live in such a way as to be reconcilers and peacemakers. I have no idea how the church in the Middle East is facing up to that challenge at the moment, but it seems to me it, it ought to be a global call to the whole church to be praying for peace at this time. Mm. And if we can, to be working for peace, to be writing letters, to be lobbying people uh, for any means of, of actually bringing peace in that troubled land. Tom, uh, we have seen both in the Anglican Communion as well as in the Catholic Church with the Synod on Synodality ongoing, um, there seems to be a, a desire to accommodate the world, if you will, uh, in so many ways. There's a line in chapter 12 of Romans where St. Paul says, do not conform yourselves to this age, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. Um, what would St. Paul say, do you think, as we see these <laughs> ruptures well. of communion, as we see the... Um, uh, the, the, the tossing off at times of doctrines and practice that are part of classic Christianity as we've known it. On the one hand, there is that clear imperative at the beginning of Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Of course, the question is, who says what counts as conformity or being transformed? And there are different opinions mm -hmm. about that. And later on in the chapter, Paul also says, if it be possible, as far as it lies with you, live at peace with all people. And it seems to me again and again we're caught between those two that we quite rightly want to be peacemakers and to be peace livers. But there are certain times, and the church has always known this, when the church has to say, no, actually, that's the way of the world. But God is creating a new version of humanity, which is the new uh, the return to the original dream for the human race, if you like. And we mm -hmm. in Christ and by the Spirit are supposed to be modeling and living that. And then when you look at the rest of Paul's writings, it's pretty obvious in terms of some of the debates where Paul would come out on them. But that call to transformation is there in Romans, it's there in Philippians, interestingly, particularly, mm -hmm. where Paul is really encouraging people not just to drift with the, uh, the, the, the winds of passing fashion, but actually to learn not just what to think, but how to think, how to think in Christ, mm -hmm. how to have your thinking formed by the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And again and again, it's much easier for the church just to slide along with the way the, the world is doing things. I'm not saying that's what's happening at the moment because I say I haven't followed the debates, but that is always the challenge. And again and again, as yeah. we look at church history, it's when the church has said, no, actually, the way of transformed humanity looks like this. That's when the church has been true and faithful to the gospel. Yeah. And, and at times, as you mentioned in the book, that can bring on a fair amount of suffering. But that, too, is part of the journey, part of Christ's model, part of St. Paul's yeah. witness to us. Were there any breakthrough moments that you experienced as you wrote into the heart of Romans. For me, the, the breakthrough moment was a fresh reading of the middle section of chapter 8, which is a lot about mm -hmm. suffering, uh, as you mentioned. Of course, mm -hmm. part of the problem with saying that suffering is part of the deal is that sometimes Christians have suffered for reasons which were nothing to do with the gospel. It was just because they were being right. obstreperous or awkward or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it's then a matter of discernment. Is this suffering happening because we're being faithful or despite the fact that we're being, or because we're being stupid or whatever. But then for me, 
Um, I had read, as many have, I had read the whole chapter as being simply about salvation, whereas in fact verses 12 to 30, which is the long middle section of chapter 8, mm -hmm. are really about vocation. They're about what is the church there for? And the church is there to be the new model of the human race in the face of the wild and woolly world, which is doing its own stuff. And so the wild and woolly world is going to um, dislike that intensely and is going to pour out suffering on. And Paul is writing in the middle or, or, or yeah. even the late 50s, uh, first century. And within a decade, the church in Rome suffered agonizingly because of the persecution under the Emperor Nero. So Paul, I think, had a premonition mm. of that. But part of that vocation is to be the people who he says are conformed to the image of the Son, which is Christ on the cross, and that somehow the suffering of Christ on the cross, which won redemption for the world, has to be lived out again by the Spirit in the followers of Jesus who go through this same thing so that the love of God may be present in the midst of the wounded and suffering world. And that vocation is something that the church at its best has often known about, but people haven't always seen it in Romans because in the long traditions of interpretation, people have simply seen that as, oh, well, we're on the way to heaven, and so this is how we get there. We've got to go through a dark patch to get there. But actually, Romans 8 yeah. isn't about going to heaven. It's about how the life of heaven in the person of the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us to bring us to be the people that God wants us to be. Mm. N.T. Wright, always a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter by N.T. Wright is out in stores now and online at all the book outlets. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you very much. Good to be with you.